Hello, everyone. Hello, Homestead. Uh, I'm Greg Gilio, the principal of Homestead High School, and have another uh, weekly video message for you. And I have my guests with you. I have our school-based therapists. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. So Shabby, can you start us off? Hi, my name is Shabnam Afshar, but I go by Shabby, and I'm one of the school-based therapists at Homestead High School. And I'm Don Pridium, and I'm a school-based therapist at Homestead. Um, Shabby and I actually uh, do most of our work with our uh, resource or our special ed population. Um, we work in a couple of our specialized programs, and then we also see students who have therapy on their IEPs. Um, and so we have regular counseling sessions weekly with those students. Um, and then we also obviously step in with the larger population um, whenever there's a need there too. I am Sarah Lloyd and I work with the larger population um, and I help out with crisis and drop-in students. Great. So can you kind of help explain for uh, the parents who are watching sort of what's the difference between a therapist and a school-based therapist? Any of you can take that who wants to take that? Um, well, we are, have the same licensure as a regular outside therapist. Um, however, we primarily focus on school-based issues and um, tend to steer clear of any kind of like deep processing work. Um, it's more about helping manage uh, situations and emotional distress that um, either impact the student's ability to learn and or um, the effects of their environment. And we definitely do, we use similar um, similar styles and processes, but it definitely, um, we do not take the place of a community-based therapist for students. We typically are uh, either the crisis management piece of what's something that's happening um, out on the school site that's interfering with their academic progress, uh, or we're supplementing outside support. So we're helping them um, utilize techniques and, and skills that they're building in their community-based therapy um, on the school site. So whether it's around anxiety or depression or things like that, um, mostly because we have to really stay steer clear of those bigger issues because we can't ask students to open up to us about um, a really traumatic experience and then send them back to math class or, you know, tell them to hang on to that for six weeks while we're on summer break. <laughs> so, so we really are uh, really focused on the things that are kind of immediate needs or impacting their education. Okay. So, and this is an extremely stressful time for everybody, for adults and students. And, and we have definitely seen an increase in, in needs and, and requests for mental health support. So can you kind of talk about maybe what are some of the things that you're seeing our kids are, in, are dealing with or what are some things their parents could expect that their kids are having to deal with right now? Sarah, do you want to speak a little bit to some of the, the requests and the drop-ins that you yeah. I think um, as of right now, it's a lot of crisis fatigue. We've kind of, we're almost at the year mark um, for an event that we thought would be three weeks and um, we're all kind of over it and adults too. And there's a lot of lack of motivation, a lot of anxiety about when this is going to end, if we are going to come back physically to school. Um, and so our students are tuning out and they're tired and they're anxious and um, I think that the adults are as well, and we all need to be have some have some grace with our students and your child. I also I think, think those are the top things, yeah. Yeah, what we're also seeing, especially as we get towards um, the end of the year, and we've got seniors that are losing, you know, what potentially could be their entire senior year. Um, you know, we've got freshmen that have never stepped foot on campus, so they have no connection to Homestead. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of grief and loss, I think, that's happening for, for students that, um, that I think they may be not recognizing as that. They may just be feeling it as kind of overall sadness or fatigue um, or that lack of motivation. But I think there is a lot of grief and loss just around things that they were expecting and those expectations, you know, missing those things and, um, and not having the opportunity to make those up at any point. So those big kind of life things that those tr transitions are, there's a lot of grief and loss around those transitions, I think. Yeah. yeah and I think there's also like um, a lack of ways to cope or just even um, enjoy life. Like 
Um, you know, you can't go out with your friends, you can't play sports, you can't, you know, just go out and eat. Um, and so even those kind of simple joys aren't there um, as ways to kind of cope and or just live your life. And so that's hard for them as well. So we have had, you know, a couple of advisories in the first semester where thankfully you guys helped us with uh, some mental health or mental wellness uh, advisories. We're hoping to do some more a second semester too, but what are some things and resources that are on campus right now that parents or students can tap into to try and deal with these, these things that you were all just talking about? So as of right now, um, we are all available, um, mostly uh, myself, and you can reach us at the wellness check-in form, which is on our school website under, in the student portal. Um, both students and parents um, can fill that out. We also have our virtual mindfulness room, which is also on the student section of the website. We have the mental health team Instagram page, um, which also has a link to get a hold of us, and that's at H H S S H H S mental health team. Um, and then we have our Mustang peer support group, which is holding venting sessions a couple of times a month where it's all anonymous and students can come and just vent about what is going on. Excellent. Other uh, supports or, or resources that uh, you'd like parents to know about or either Shabby or, or Don? Was that covered? I think Sarah, Sarah covered them. I, I think <laughs> things I'd love parents to do is I know it's hard with high school students, but getting their kids up and in a routine and active, um, mm -hmm. you know, we, I know that we're seeing a lot of kids who are, who are home, right. Because they can't be out doing things, but they're just sitting in their room all day long. So, you know, getting them outside. Um, I sometimes force my own children out in our front yard with their from books, <laughs> just to get some fresh air. Um, so yeah, so really kind of getting getting kids active and, and giving them some time outside, I think is important as we spend so much time on screens right now. Yeah. Great. Well, I, I wanna thank the three of you for, for coming in and, and giving our parents a little bit of information and getting to see the faces behind uh, the emails and, the, and the, some of the resources out there. So again, when you fill out that wellness check-in form, these are the folks that will be getting that and working with your kids. Um, and so again, we've really appreciated your support and help as well through a lot of the issues we've been dealing with this year. So um, I'm glad to give you a little airtime here so we can get other people to, to know how great you guys are. So thank you for, for coming in. I'm going to let you guys go and continue doing what you do uh, so well. And uh, I'm going to continue on with my weekly video message. So thank you guys. All right. Thank Thanks so much. much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. All right. So I'm going to share my screen here as we get ready for our weekly video message for this is uh, February 12th, 2021. Um, and oops, I'm not in presentation mode yet. Let me get in presentation mode. That would make it easier. There we go. Um, and so this is uh, the, the 12th is actually the, the Lunar New Year. So happy Lunar New Year to everyone. Uh, it's been called a bunch of different things, whether it's the Lunar New Year or Spring Festival or Chinese New Year. Um, but this is technically the start of the new year for calendars whose months follow the cycle of the moon. And so you may have seen or hear or will be seeing folks who celebrate the Lunar New Year uh, with doing some of these kinds of celebrations, whether they're you know, wearing or, or sharing lucky red items. Uh, this is a time for family time, gatherings, and dinners and meals. Um, although that might be a little hard in, in this distance time, but that's usually part of the tradition. Uh, you, you often see a lot of fireworks and firecrackers going on, which is uh, in the original, uh, movement was to try and scare away some of the evil spirits, which we could definitely use right now. Um, and then you also, it's a time to give gifts or especially red envelopes uh, that sometimes contain money. So, um, but you know, one of the things that I, I wanted to point out in terms of the Lunar New Year is um, right now, our Asian American communities across the, uh, the area, across the state, across the country are facing a lot of violence and, and backlash. Uh, and so, they have asked that we stand up and be allies uh, to, to stand with them to get against the Asian American, anti-Asian American uh, violence that's been on the rise, especially uh, with a lot of the anger and frustration about COVID-19. There have been a lot of recent and local incidents where um, 
individuals, uh, Asian Americans have been getting attacked uh, and hurt. And so again, I, I would encourage you all to be an ally, to stand up for those in our community. Uh, you know, our Asian community here at, at Homestead is one of our largest communities on campus, um, but obviously they could definitely use our support uh, and our allyship at this time. So I think that'd be a great way to honor the Lunar New Year in doing that. So hopefully you get a chance to do that. Um, moving on to our the actual survey. Again, remember I take all the information that you send me uh, through the parent survey and, and put this information here. And this, this month being Black History Month also, we are spotlighting, putting our spotlight on excellence or in a more uh, colloquial way, we are uh, offering Valentine's out to those who deserve it. So um, our first uh, spotlights or Valentine go out to Shannon Vakili and Verna Grant. They are, uh, they work in our library, our library media teacher and aide. Um, and they have for creating this something called the blind date with a book um, and where they were uh, connecting students with a book based on some interests that they filled out on a survey uh, and for various craft events throughout the year. So this parent really wanted to thank them for, for uh, their creativity and, and their going out of the way to help folks there. Uh, there was also a big, and I quoted this one because it was so great, bravo to all the creators of the career interview library. So useful for Homestead students. Wish something like this had existed when I was a teen. Um, now, the, the career, for those of you who don't know what the career interview library is, it is a, a, an event sponsored by the PTSA. It used to be before pandemic time, it was actually, um, you'd go out and do an internship or you go and, and do, you know, follow along uh, a possible person who's in a career that you like, couldn't do that at this particular time. And so they changed it to doing this career interview um, library, which is where students interview people that they are interested in, who are in careers that they're interested in. And they ha have, we have those on the internet for you. Uh, also our, our, our college and career coordinator, or counselor Vicki Salazar is the one who helps um, uh, organize that. And if you actually go to her web page or go to the web page on our, our website, um, you'll see something that sort of looks like this on the on the left side there. And if you see down at the bottom, it, this is on the, the college and career uh, portal of the website. Go down to career interview, click that. That'll bring you to this side over here where you'll get, these are just a couple of the videos there. There's a bunch of them on there, but kind of tell you who the person is that they are interviewing, what their career is, uh, and then the students that did that interview, and there's a bunch of them on there. They really are pretty cool, um, and it's a great, it, you know, great uh, tool to have. And so, um, again, sometimes in crazy times like a pandemic, you come up with a really good solution. So I really want to thank the PTSA uh, for for switching gears on us and helping us with that. So definitely deserving all the shout outs. So if you get a chance, please go to that website and and have your kids go check it out uh, and see if there's anything that they interesting. And if they don't see one that they like, they could possibly do their own and and, and get another one added on to there. Um, going into our question section, um, the first question was a, was a, a question about how come uh, Homestead can't guarantee course selections, their first choices of all the students. And so this is uh, it always happens every time about this time of year. Um, the, the master schedule and course selection process is a very complicated one. While it sounds simple, like I just pick courses and you put me in the class, there's a lot of things that go into this. And it, 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 it's the reason we start in February and we don't usually finish it till about August because there's a lot of things that go into it. But it is our goal to get every student their first choice. Sometimes though, that doesn't always happen. And then I'll explain why. But what happened, we are given a certain number of sections based on the number of students we have here. It's a basic formula um, that the district says, okay, you have X amount of students. And so you will get Y amount of, of sections. And, and then, but we do have some variety within those sections because some classes are bigger or smaller than others. For instance, a PE class or a music class tends to be pretty big because they function better when they're big. Uh, but another class might be smaller. It could be like a freshman class could be 25 kids or a support class could be 15 kids. So you have all these different numbers that come in, um, but you have an average and that's with the number of sections. So we have to work within the number of sections that we're given. And so what ends up happening is you know, when kids sign up for a class, we kind of basically work in, in chunks of 30. This, just to be simplistic, it makes it a little easier. So if I have 30 kids sign up for underwater basket weaving, I can do one section of that. And I, you know, I say, okay, that makes sense. If I have 60 kids sign up for it, that gives me two sections. Those are all nice and clean. But if we have something in between, like let's say we have 45 students sign up for it, I, have to, I can only give that one section because I can't have a section that is below, more sections that are below those agreed upon amounts and in that ratio. And so what ends up happening is those, like in that 
45 students who selected, 30 of them will get the class, 15 of them won't. And the way that you do that is we don't just randomly pick kids and say, oh, you're in or out. There are other things that will actually start to affect the choices. And like the last bullet point there, there are, you know, the more restrictions a student puts into their schedule, the harder it's going to be to, to grant those requests. And the analogy I always like to use is, you know, when you're trying to buy an airplane ticket to go somewhere, if you just say, I'll leave at any time, I don't care how many layovers, I don't care, you know, whether it leaves in the morning or the evening or the middle of the night, um, you can get just about any flight and any, you'll get a million choices. But when you start to put restrictions on, you say, I only want you know, one, you know, one, one stop or less, I has to leave at, you know, before nine o'clock in the morning, I can only, you know, right, you start to add those restrictions, you're only going to get a few number of, of classes or a few number of flights to get out there. Same thing with our schedule here. So if you're picking classes where there are singletons or maybe just doubletons, which means there's only one of those classes offered, um, you know, that might be like an AP, let's say AP music theory. Um, that's going to be only offered one time because we usually don't get a big number of kids signing up for that um, versus say AP Calc where you have a bunch of kids signing up for you have multiple sections. So when you start to have those singletons and that gets cemented into the, into the schedule, now you start to have restrictions on where you can place other, other classes. And it may be that there are 15 of those 45 kids that selected something like a singleton and it's going to prevent them from going into that particular class and so we have to that's how we have to start to move maneuver people around so it might not be that we're saying you can't have it it might be that the choices you made in terms of your selections your course selections prevents you from having it so again we we try to fill them all out and get into where we can but in the end there are some things that are outside of our control another thing that really also starts to to um, affect this and, and this is a little bit harder sometimes people say is like well if you know, if you have, you know, a bunch of kids sign up for it, why can't you just keep having, you know, hiring more teachers and having more sections? Well, again, we have to work within that number of sections, but what also affects that number of sections are the properly credentialed teachers, as well as the classrooms that are available for that particular class. Sometimes like an English class, you can have that in any classroom, but a science class, you can only have that in a certain classroom. A chemistry classroom you can only have that in a very specific classroom. And so you're limited by the number of times that that class can be offered with the the number of classrooms, as well as how many teachers do I have? If I don't have 15, you know, credentialed chemistry teachers, I can't offer that many classes, right? So it, it really, there's all these things start to come into effect. So um, we try to do our best. There are a lot of things that, that affect those choices. Um, and again, you know, we, there is a process of like, we try to get you those, we will do the reverse course verification where we send to you, okay, these are the classes you signed up for. Are you, are you sure these are the ones you want? Because we're going to start to try and build based on what you pick. Um, so again, we will do our best. Can't guarantee though. That's why. Um, another talking about classes. Uh, questions coming up like, can, what what's going on with the AP tests due to COVID? Um, last year, you know, a lot of them were done, or all of them were done remotely, uh, and they were done very simplistically. There there have been some changes to that, so we've been given some some. Uh, some options and some some ideas about how the the college board is going to do that. They are indeed still happening. Uh, students have already had to sign up for them, so they should have already signed up for courses. Um, and so what we know is that some of the classes, some of the tests have to be done remotely or can be done remotely. Some of them have to be done in person. Um, and so it's a matter of us trying to balance out what that is. But you know where where we start to run into issues is that some of those that can be done in person may not be able to be done in person based on the safety protocols or the restrictions that are in place for that testing when they, we do the testing. So we just don't know yet, but we will be trying to make, you know, come up with a schedule that works the best that we can. We know that tests are scheduled through May and June, and we know that June is probably not the best time for AP tests, but again, based on how we might be able to administer some of these tests and what the, the facts are that we're given, we may have some tests that are in June. And if that's, if that's gonna happen, um, there will be opportunities for, for refunds if, if uh, conflicts do arise. So I don't want people to feel like, oh, I've paid for this, I can't get out of it. Um, there, if, if they do get scheduled, but some of them could be a little bit later in June, which I know is, is not usual, but again, we're not in usual times, but we are going through meetings as we speak. There should be some details coming out um, after this winter break to, to, to really know where we are. Um, but again, we're, we need to do this together as a, as a district not just as a site. So I don't get to make a decision that's different than Monta Vista's. We're really trying to, 
you know, have everybody work on the same thing because it, it, it's it's part of that system that needs to be the same. Um, so again, I don't have a, the more specific details for you, but just know these are sort of the basics that we are trying to work within right now and, and make some best decisions. Um, there was a, um, a parent who had a concern that their student was watching a video, uh, I'm assuming through Schoology, and the video resource that they were using wouldn't allow the student to fast forward or more particularly, they, I guess they got booted off when they were watching, like their internet failed. And so they couldn't fast forward to where they needed to be or where they were. They had to start all over again and watch it. It was sort of a long video. Um, again, part of, a lot of the reasons why you'll see these resources, they don't have a fast forward on them is, is to ensure that students actually watch the video because you know sometimes students will just fast forward through and they'll miss big pieces. Uh, and then so we want them to actually watch it and not have the ability to fast forward through. So that is one of the reasons there. Um, if, if the internet glitches and you're not able to get back to where you were, that's probably more a function of your own internet than ours. Um, and so again, because it was your internet that stopped, it, 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 you didn't, aren't able to save it and figure it out that way. Um, but again, what I would definitely do is if you have an internet issue, please talk to the teacher uh, and let them know what's going on and they might be able to help you. They might be able to say, oh, well, let me send you this or let me, let me show you how to do that or I'll give you a different link so that you can fast forward through it. Um, so don't hesitate to ask the teachers that I mean, we are living in, in you know, remote learning times where internet uh, issues happen all the time. I got kicked off <laughs> the, the eighth grade, incoming ninth grade parent meeting the other night um, while I was doing my welcome speech. So um, thankfully, Mr. Wright picked it up for me. But again, those fumbles happen. So we, we're definitely happy to try and help you or your students. So um, again, it wasn't meant to be punitive or any of that kind of stuff. It's probably just more of a function of the fact that it was your internet went down and so it didn't save it at that point. So, um, but again, talk to your teacher if you have any other of those issues that go on. Um, this, uh, this particular slide is one I wanted to address. I didn't put the entire answer down here, um, but um, there, I, I do try to go through all of the questions and sometimes that's a bit of a challenge because sometimes the, the questions are written in a way that are pretty mean spirited or, or, or passive aggressive or <laughs> overly aggressive. Um, I, I do admit, I did, I did forget a question last week and I have that question at the bottom, uh, at the end of my thing here, so I don't worry, I'm getting that. But um, I wanted to address this one because there was a particular comment that was made in here and the basic of it was that teachers aren't, at Homestead aren't teaching. Um, and there were a few other um, not so nice comments in there. But what I would ask is that I, I'm, gonna tr I'm gonna answer the questions, but what would be helpful is if you give some context or provide something constructive. Um, just saying teachers don't teach, that really doesn't tell me anything because I can, I can come back to you and say, yes, they are. Um, you know, there may be something that you don't feel they're teaching or there may be an incident where something happened. If you can give me some of those details, I'll be happy to try and address that. Um, but what I can tell you is, uh, again, our, our staff is dealing with the same issues that all of you are during the pandemic. That they're at home, their kids are there, they're tired, as you heard our, our school-based therapists talk about the fatigue that our students and our staff and our parents are feeling. Um, and so this is not the uh, best way to teach. And we know that, and that's not, and we want to be back in, in person, um, but we are trying to deal with this, this you know, new way of doing things. And so I would uh, say that, yeah, maybe sometimes we aren't as good as we could be, or we, we can in person. Um, but, but please know that our teachers are doing everything they can and they're working super hard. Um, I can also tell you that our admin team does go through classrooms. We do pop on Zooms to do either formal or informal um, observations. So the, the formal ones were there for 90 minutes. The informal ones were just there for a couple of minutes. So I've gone through a lot of classrooms and I can tell you, I'm seeing a lot of really good things going on. A lot of creativity, a lot of work. Um, again, teachers are teaching. They're just doing it in a different way. I can also tell you that uh, our teams, our teams of teachers do work together collaboratively. And so those, those days where our teachers are meeting and I pop into those meetings too, I'm, I'm the liaison to the math department. So I was in a bunch of math meetings this so far this week um, and they're talking about pacing and they're talking about the strategies that they're gonna be using to instruct students. They're talking about how do we grade these things. They're talking about what building tests, how to make the tests better, how to make the tests uh, work and say the things that they need to say. Also working on interventions. So I can tell you those conversations are definitely have, being had. Uh, this is, uh, you know, an opportunity that we have during this remote time is that we actually, our teachers are able to go to a lot more professional developments uh, because they don't have to travel. They don't have to miss class as much. 
Um, and so they can actually remotely log on and get some professional training and get some professional development. Sometimes it's something that the district might be doing, or it might be something that outside of the district is happening. Again, it's all happening virtually. They're not traveling to those places, but our teachers are also still trying to learn and still understand um, how to do a lot of the things that we're doing remotely um, and, and how to do things better. Um, but I would say to you, if you have a very specific concern, and this, this person was definitely frustrated, um, and you, know, you want to bring it up to me, please let me know. Spell it out to me. Give it to me. If you want to do it anonymously, that's fine. Um, you know, again, that's why I make it optional for you to give me your name. But I, I just need a little more information to go off of than saying teachers don't teach, because I, I can give you a million pieces of evidence that, shows, that show that they do. And, and you know, I've been accused of being defensive in some of my answers before, and, and, and I, I'll admit I'm probably being way more defensive here on this one. But um, again, I, I think we're all dealing with something we've never dealt with before. And I think our teachers are really trying to do the best they can. And, and we're not perfect. There's mistakes that we've made and things that we're trying to do better. Uh, and, and I can tell you that our unions are working really hard with, with us to try and come back. They wanna figure out how do we come back safely uh, how, when will the county allow us to come back? Those are some of the conversations that we're having. So understand that the, the teachers aren't, you know, aren't, aren't sitting at home with their feet up and, and eating bonbons while their you know, kids are struggling. They're struggling too. Um, and so uh, they're, but they're also trying to do the best they can to get everyone back. So again, just please give me some context and give me some, some information. I'm happy to help. If, if you want to give me your name and I can talk to you individually or if you, if you go over something specific, happy to do that too. I'm not going to hold it against you, um, but please just, just give us some more information to work on. Um, I want to point out that uh, there was an email that just came out. Hopefully you saw it, it came from me. Uh, this is something we're pretty excited about. Again, dealing with this pandemic time, we know that times have been pretty hard on our students and it's been much more of a struggle for students to learn remotely. Uh, and so our board has just voted to approve a, a proposal that's a credit opportunity for students who failed a class during first semester. So basically what will happen is any student who failed a first semester class um, you get an F on your transcript and you have zero credits. Normally you have to go to summer school or to night school or some other way to make up that class. Um, what we have proposed and what the board has accepted is that this year because of the remote learning because of the pandemic, students who pass second semester with a grade of D or above, which is a passing grade, they will receive 10 units of credit, which means you have finished the complete year. So let's say you failed first semester of English. And so then if you pass second semester of English, you don't just get five credits, you get 10 credits and that grade there. The F will still stay on the transcript. Um, that is something that kind of technically we can't change because it's what was awarded that time, but we can uh, give you those extra credits for, even though it's not extra credit, the, the, the five more credits for completing the class because what ends up really happening is for, in order for you to get a, a passing grade second semester, you really have to build on the skills that you were given first semester. So maybe you didn't quite master them then, or maybe you weren't quite jiving with the way um, remote learning was going. You know, by the time you're able to pass it now, we will give you those 10 credits of the passing grade. There's nothing that you need to do. There's nothing that the teacher needs to do. This, this change will come at the after grades are, are given. So there's gonna be a little bit of a time lag. So, you know, let's say you were that student who failed first semester English, you pass it with, let's say a C uh, second semester, you're gonna, you know, we're gonna have to go back in and we, the administrators and the counselors are gonna go back in and physically change that to 10 units so that it shows a passing grade. So you're gonna be a little bit of patient there, but uh, we're definitely gonna go ahead and do that. Something to throw out that our, again, our, cal our, our counselors and our administrators will be tracking this, will be encouraging your students, will be sending information to individually out to them. Um, what this really does is it keeps students eligible to graduate. It, it may not be accepted. It most likely will not be accepted by colleges. Um, so just I need you to understand that that's, there's a difference there that in terms of what a college will accept as a passing grade versus what we can assign as a passing grade. So um, that's one of probably the downsides of it. But again, if you failed a class uh, in the first semester, you have an opportunity to stay motivated. I would encourage you to, to talk to your teachers, to talk to your counselor, uh, and, and figure out ways that you don't have to go to summer school, you don't have to do night school, if you can really, you know, get it together for this semester and there's a lot using some of the supports and resources that we have. So this is a very exciting opportunity. I'm really glad our board uh, vote, voted to approve it. Uh, and I'm hoping that your students get a chance to, to take part in it and to uh, benefit from it. Um, 
finally, before we go out to our mental health, uh, before we go out, I just want to remind you of some of the mental health resources that our three guests talked. So our three guests were Sarah Lloyd, uh, Don Predium, and, and Shabby Afshar. Um, those are their email addresses. They mentioned things like the mental wellness check-in form, which is um, on the student portal of the website. Uh, again, they are the people that will receive those emails when you say, I have a concern about my student, or if the student writes in and says, here's my concerns. Um, they mentioned things like the virtual mindfulness room, the venting sessions. The venting sessions have been something sort of new and um, they're being monitored by adults and, and um, keeping them appropriate. Uh, but it's really been a great way for the kids to, to vent some of their frustration and for us to get some feedback and, and help and work with them. Um, and there's also <clears throat> always uh, prevention and intervention resources. There's a button for that on our parent portal. Um, so please take a look at that. Um, and so moving on, there are some important dates uh, that are coming up. And so I want you to be aware of them. Winter break is happening this week or next week anyway. So that's, I misspelled the word too there. Uh, from February 15th to the 19th, uh, the office is going to be closed. Campus is going to be closed. Now there will be students on here doing practices and, and sports and that kind of stuff. But for general purposes, the campus is closed at that time. There's also no food service happening uh, on that Wednesday, which is 217. So again, hopefully you were able to come to food service this week where you kind of got double portions. Um, and so that was how they were dealing with that, but they will be back uh, the week after that, the week after February break. Um, uh, also want to let you know that uh, we've been talking about course selection in, on, in advisory on the 24th, there will be a course selection advisory for students that our guidance counselors will be, um, will be uh, facilitating. Uh, the 26th of February is also the end of the first grading period of the second semester. So again, it's a progress report. It's not a final grade, uh, but it gives you a snapshot of where your student is at this particular time. Um, there is on the March 3rd is going to be an in-person SAT uh, test for 11th graders. It's going to be during the school day. It's going to, and we've done that so that our own students are going to be able to come on campus. We won't be mixed with outside students. Um, and so we're able to kind of keep a lid on that. Um, but you'll be hearing more details about that as it comes up, but you should have already signed up for that because I believe all the spots are taken at this point. Um, you know, you heard me talk about the, the great folks up in the library with Shannon Vakili and Verna Grant. Uh, one of the cool activities they got going on is a, a virtual library book fair that's going to be happening starting March 3rd through the, the uh, 19th. So again, while we're still kind of uh, at home and in a little bit of lockdown, maybe you can get yourself a good book or your students a good book that uh, you guys can enjoy and share around and talk about. Um, there will be a special schedule the week of 315 through 319. Uh, the 15th, which is a Monday, is actually a day, uh, a non-student day, and, and so students do not come to school that day. So we're going to run that week sort of like we've done some of the other weeks, like we, what we did for Martin Luther King Day. There is the, um, that Tuesday will operate like a skinny day. All the classes will meet, all seven periods will meet for about 45 minutes. The Wednesday will remain an asynchronous day like it always is and Thursday and Friday will be normal days. We're getting that put together and it'll be on our website here soon. Um, and then just a heads up that our multicultural fair is gonna be put on by our ASB students on uh, the week of March 22nd through March 26th. Uh, there'll be advisory that week on the multicultural fair and uh, there'll be a lot of fun activities and good things going on. So again, I thank you for uh, coming to uh, and watching our video here and I hope you enjoyed meeting our counselors, our mental health, counsel mental health counselors. And I hope you get to you know, use some of the resources they have out there or, or, or if you get a chance to send in a wellness check that uh, you'll get a chance to meet them at some point. Um, anyway, thank you, take care and have a great break. <laughs>